So first of all, uh, we need to talk about Tony. Was it the plan from the beginning to kind of have a trans clone, or was that something that came up uh, in the breaking of season two? It actually came up at the end of, near the end of season one, and it was uh, it was an idea that kind of occurred simultaneously in the writers' room and with John and I, as well as in the makeup trailer <laughs> with uh, with Tatiana and her team there, Stephen and Sandy. Um, and John and I took Tad out for dinner when we wrapped season one, just to talk about what we were thinking. And you know, this came out of our mouths, and she just said, "I can't believe it," because we were talking about the same thing. Um, so it was a very long process and a long process of uh, creating and discovering that that uh, that character. Hello. <laughs> Did you guys miss everything I said? Um, you want to talk about? Uh, any? Uh, I don't know. What? Uh, I suppose uh, it was interesting that evening having a conversation with her because we kind of said. You know, we talked about, we knew that we wanted to introduce a new clone this season, uh, and there was lots of different ideas, and it was interesting that we, we Tatiana and Graham and I had kind of landed on the same idea um, separately. And so that was, uh, and she she just kind of embraced that kind of fearlessly, and, and uh, we kind of charged forward with, uh, with this new character, Tony. It obviously worked wonderfully, but... Obviously, you can't speak for Tatiana, but can you talk a little bit about those conversations and what went into creating Tony's look and mannerisms between the three of you? Uh, well, uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, research, but it was it was a fun process because it was super top secret, right? So, you know, we Graham and I would get calls out to the makeup trailer at like strange times and just come out, you know, and, and then you know they'd all be hiding in there, and there'd be you know there would be Tony. And so it was kind of this process of like, you know, and, and Tat would come in on her days off and on the weekend and, you know, they'd shoot pictures and we'd correct things and and it was uh, it was fun. It was, but it was like not, the crew didn't know what we were doing. Uh, you know, the crew didn't know what we were doing right up until we had to give scripts out to, to shoot the episode. So it was, uh, and it was interesting that first day on set because it was it was uh, it was that was the quietest I've ever heard it on set. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone shock was and very, awe. very. It was a bit of shock and awe, and it was very, but very like respectful of 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 what Tat was uh, doing, and uh, and it was uh, yeah, it was it was it was a bit of a trip shooting it and uh, and just screening it. That's for sure. You guys liked it, right? <laughs> <laughs> very good. And uh, obviously, it seems like it's a very collaborative process between you guys and Tatiana. Can you talk a little bit about working with her and kind of what she brings, apart from obviously what we see, the amazing transformation she has between all these characters? Um, yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, it is, it's very collaborative, it's very rewarding. Um, not only when we're creating uh, a new clone, and of course, we, we don't do that lightly. We really want to know these people. We don't don't do a lot of red shirts. Um, uh, so, you know, a lot goes into developing a clone like Tony, but also as the, as the story unfolds, Tatiana, we, you know, we could get stuck in the writer's room and we can go, what about this? And, and she'll have an idea of, of character response for these characters that she inhabits so well. And, you know, that... Um, early in the process, it really started with Helena, where um, as the writers were struggling to get hold of this psychopath that we, we knew we wanted to redeem over the course of season one and make sympathetic, we just weren't sure how. And Tatiana was the one who said, well, Helena is proceeding from a place of love. She just doesn't know how to love. Everybody went, you know, all the writers went, light bulb, okay, now we can write that character. So. It's that kind of thing when you approach Tatiana with character issues that she has this incredible emotional attachment to, uh, and um, knowledge of these characters. So, uh, you know, it wouldn't do us any good to try and do it without her. Uh, let's also talk about uh, Tony and Felix's kiss. Because I know Game of Thrones has made incest trendy, but... Obviously, I kind of wanted you guys to go there just for the hell of it, but also I was a little bit like, 
squeamish about it. So was that kind of the reaction you had in the writing of it? You kind of wanted to, but also realized that it was a little bit twisted? Well, it's definitely a little bit twisted, and, I, and we have to give credit to Jordan and Tatiana, because they were dying to do that. <laughs> It, you know, and on one level for us it's so strange because it's like, it's not just that kiss with all its many layers uh, uh, going on. For us, it's just like, Jordan and Dad, they're kissing us. Because it must be like brother and sister kissing, <laughs> really, <laughs> at this point. Yeah. But they were, they were all for it. Yeah, it was, uh, I, I know this was for Jordan, it was definitely, uh, he was kind of, like really excited but terrified at the same time you know just this just mapping his way through this episode and uh yeah we we were all excited on that uh, that day when we knew it was all going to go down and uh, it, was, yeah, it turned out pretty good <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you guys obviously aren't afraid to push the envelope with stuff like that do you ever get kind of pushback from standards and practices i remember like helena and the prolethians and the egg harvesting like was an awful, terrifying sequence, which is kind of the point of it. Do you, do you kind of get pushback? Do you get any notes on that kind of thing that you have to? Hmm. We, uh, you know, we're we're fortunate uh, in our uh, our our situation with our, our our two broadcasters, BBC America and Space uh, Network in Canada. Uh, they're they they've just fully embraced this weird, wacky journey that we're going on and. Uh, and we always kind of are, you know, we're always a little bit like, I wonder what the broadcaster's going to say about this one. And they, you know, they, they surprise us all the time. They're, they're so into the wild stuff that we throw at them. And, uh, and so is Tat, and so is our, our cast, because they, we, we, we're, we, I mean, we're making this weird show, you know? And, uh, and it's even weirder this season. And, um, and fun and uh, no, it's, you know. So far, we've been uh, we've we've been uh, we've been really fortunate. I think Graham and I have uh, have uh, really enjoyed our experience, and and no one's really said no to us yet. That um, it it started though in season one with the tail. There, and there was a lot of debate about the tail. You guys are going too far with the tail. The tail is and pushing it. We clearly. we we were like. We want the tail, <laughs> and 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 you know the, the the we were allowed to to do the tail. We we had to uh, we had to edit it. I think maybe the tail sequence did go on a lot longer, um, but you know it 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 worked, and and everybody was like, wow, that's the edge of the weirdness. And if we could just stay, um, you know, with our toes on the edge, then then uh, we should be okay. On that note, I kind of want to. I think. You guys deserve a round of applause for making Orphan Black probably the most progressive show on TV in current time. Gender and, and sexuality and just the portrayal of female characters in general. It's, you know, was that something that you're kind of interested in as artists anyway? Or was it just that this story you felt like you had to have all of these viewpoints to be able to tell it properly? Or I guess a combination of both. Yeah, it's a, it's a, bit, a, bit, of, it's a bit of both. We'd, I mean, we certainly didn't set out to make a feminist show. <laughs> the, the show, the themes of the show and the embodiment of Tat with all these characters made, you know, made the theme. We, re we realized the, the power of, of the themes that we were playing with, um, but to land them is difficult and to commit to them takes uh, really good writers and it takes um, full commitment from Tatian. I, I think, I, I, listen, I, I just think that we, we, amidst all the kind of the, the absurdity of the premise, I think what was important for us was to kind of create uh, characters and, and situations that people can kind of identify with and, and believe in. Because I think that for uh, genre television, which we kind of are making, uh, more or less, uh, it, it, to me, all these weird. Uh, like ab uh, absurd premises go down and uh, so much better when you can believe in the characters and when you can invest in the characters and and um, and and that was just a really important aspect. We we didn't want to make a cartoon 
we, you know, much as you can kind of hang the soccer mom label on Allison, there's so many other layers to her, and the characters are very deep and complex, and the, and the story is just entertaining, right? It's just a big, one big puzzle cube. And um, I, I think we're, we're surrounded by so many different people in, in our lives that we just wanted to kind of, you know, it's a, it's a story about identity and uh, sort of, you know, uh, s celebrating our, our similarities and our differences. So that's... Very nice. On that note, um, one of the scenes that I loved, especially episode five, uh, Rachel and Paul's sex scene, <laughs> um, was a great reversal of gender norms, obviously, for her. You know, she owned it, and him, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> and for him, it was probably, you know, coerced, if not completely non-consensual. Can you talk a little bit about developing that storyline, deciding to go that way with those two? Because it was just such a fascinating scene and dynamic between them. I think it's interesting watching Paul sort of caught in this situation and trying to be in control of the situation. Ultimately, I think, you know, uh, Paul is, I mean, Rachel is, she's aggressive, but she's still attractive. And I, I think that that's, uh, it's interesting watching him struggle with like kind of desire and yet being kind of controlled. It's a, it was a, it was an interesting uh, uh, encounter to map out for the director, for Tat and for Dylan, you know. Um, and, and ultimately, because it's becoming more clear in this episode, but you don't, you don't really know Paul's agenda. You don't know what's what's beneath it. So ultimately, it is consensual. He has to go there. Yeah. Um, he will, he wants to go there, and he needs to go there. Ultimately, it's it is consensual. It's just kinky. <laughs> it is kinky, but I think that's good because women on TV so often aren't allowed to kind of own their sexuality, and you don't really see that on TV these days. So I think that that's great that you guys are so willing to kind of portray the spectrum of you know desire, really. Um, as you said, we don't really know Paul's agenda, and he was AWOL this week, conveniently. Uh, what can you preview about what's coming up for him and uh, this ghost? Nothing. <laughs> All right, I had to try. <laughs> That's fair. Um, you left Kasima in an awful state, and if she dies, then we're all going to be really, really mad at you, I think, because she's amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, Kasima and Delphine? Uh, I love yous and uh, the wonderful um, weird drug trip that they took today. <laughs> Why did you decide to go that route for uh, for that I love yous? And uh, can you talk about developing that scene? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's paying off a promise from season one, which which we liked. Um, and you know, we even though it's there's a lot of debate about it and it's not always apparent, there is true love between these two characters. I think. There's manipulation. There's all the other agendas. There's, there's, the, the 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 secrets and lies and the things they keep from one another. But ultimately, uh, they they do love one another. So, to tell someone, yeah, yeah, I love you, but I'll wreck you. <laughs> um, it's, it's honest. Uh, yeah, it's it's honest. And I and uh, Kasima is, you know, she's um, she's a super honest and. Uh, Open person who's been forced to swim with sharks, so it's kind of a w it's kind of a way for her to, uh, you know, to admit admit her heart and yet control, uh, to uh, maintain control over her biology, her future, um, uh, her sisters, uh, keep her sisters safe. Very good. Um, was I the only one who got chills over Kira reading uh, Ethan's notes at the end? Then that was. Uh, uh, Kira's kind of been, you know, she's a smart cookie, obviously, but she's been kind of a, a passive participant so far. Will we see her maybe a little more active in some way? Uh, can you tease a little bit about the development of uh, that final scene? Mm. I, I think that, uh, you know... <laughs> Without giving I nothing away. I think it's, you know, obviously the, the biology behind this and Kira uh, being the only offspring of a clone is... You know, I don't have to say that that you know it's obviously an important part of our storytelling, and um, and that Duncan has sort of chosen to 
leave this book in her possession is just it's an interesting place to kind of head into the, our last two our last two episodes of the season yeah, that works. Um, on a shallow note I really like Cal um, <laughs> yeah. I can't get a read on him right now but I guess that's by design he's very uh, mysterious but um, can you talk about uh, casting him and uh, kind of what he brings to the role machine? well um, Mikkel is a, a, a really cool actor who we had seen, we sort of had our eyes on for a little while, and, and uh, he, I mean, we were just lucky. We were fortunate that we managed to get, he's a busy guy, right? He was, uh, and, a little uh, bit. And it was, and was kind of, you know, for us, it was really cool because, you know, we were watching, watching him on Game of Thrones and, and then watching him on our show, and, uh, and uh, he, he's just, uh, you know, it, it's nice having a character that you can kind of feel like you can trust somewhat uh, on this show, anyway. Uh, and um, and he's you know he's down to earth and and uh, and working with him is is great. It's uh, you're you know going to see more of him. We got kind of a little uh, sneak peek of uh, Marion Bowles um, in the last episode, and I think Delphine was right that Leaky is probably the lesser of many. Evils. Did you have kind of any hesitation about killing Leaky, or was that always like he's got to go? He, of course, we have hesitations. We we know he's amazing. John's known Matt for a long long time. He's a he's he's really you know he's a really good good actor. Um, uh, and yeah, we had a lot of we had we had a hard time around it, but we also knew that it was going to happen. I think we knew in the first season that it was going to ha happen. Um, and, uh, you know, that that dreaded phone call to Matt, he took it like a pro. And I don't think it, it's, it wasn't a huge surprise, I don't think. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's interesting, though, can I say one of thing? Course. Is that uh, we, we, so we kind of knew that we were going to kill him. And it, it was just like, okay, so how are we going to do it? And, uh, you know, when we were sort of mapping out season two, um, Graham goes, I think Donnie should kill him. <laughs> and I was like, okay, come on. I think we're stretching the, the, uh, the, you know, the bounds of reality here. Like, uh, and we all thought it was too silly. Uh, well, I did at first. And, then, and so we went about every other possible way that we could kill him and then wound up coming back to Donnie. <laughs> And so it's this sort of, it, but, and, and what really kind of sold it for me and for, I think for everyone is this sort of crazy sort of homage to Pulp Fiction. This sort of, you know, sudden, shocking, horrifying, hilarious death. And, uh, and Matt loved that. Like, if you got to go out in a series somehow, he was, he was excited. And I was there that night. It was kind of sad to see him go, I, I admit. Uh, and he was sad to go, and he's such a great actor. And uh, but uh, yeah, that was it was interesting because that was his last night of shooting. It was like really late at night. All right, let's blow Leaky's head off. <laughs> go out with a bang, literally. My, my my favorite my favorite part of that is the the squeak on his of his head on the glass <laughs> with my, the sound the sound design guys like put this awesome squeak on the window. It's, it's great. And it kind of redeemed Donny too. And I mean, he and Allison got to bond over killing people. Yeah. So. I, yeah. What more do you want from a marriage, really? Uh, we're going to throw it over, over to you guys, because I'm sure you have a ton of questions. Uh, if you just raise your hand, and it'll be like school, and we'll just call on you. And hope that we can see you right there in the blue checks. Was it always the plan to bring Helena back? Uh, yeah. yeah it How all, could you get always. rid of Helena? Um, we, we really had the Helena, Sarah, uh, twin sister arc kind of locked in in season one. We we knew that, that that gunshot at the end of season one wasn't the last time we were going to see her, and we had the we knew the mirror twin thing. We had that in our pocket, pretty 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 early in the process, and we're building towards it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we had to. Uh, we spent a bunch of time lying our faces off, <laughs> just lying, lying, and lying. Like, and it started at Comic Con last year where we got asked about Helena. It was like. And no one had asked us that yet, and we actually hadn't had a, dis a discussion about it. And suddenly it was like, uh, she's dead. She's dead. She's dead. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, like when you tell a lie, the more you tell it, the better you get at it, you know? And so we just got pretty good at that. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. She's probably going to, too, isn't she? 
you just shoot it. I don't know. <laughs> you just shoot it and you just go, everyone sort of, you know, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> well, you guys all know how television is made. I am hoping the audience will forgive us for the girl growing between seasons. Um, sure. Uh, how do you do that, Graham? Well, <laughs> first of all, you need six super smart writers. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't start shooting now until the middle of September, and I started the writers two weeks ago. So we give ourselves a lot of lead time. We try and figure out the entire season. Allison writes herself. <laughs> we usually can go, like the first day, John and I, had, we'd spend a few days uh, sort of hiding and figuring out what we wanted to do a, a few weeks ago. Um, and I think within an hour we were like, okay, check, that's Allison. I think we knew Allison actually like <laughs> on, uh, you know, the beginning of season two. We started like riffing on crazy ideas and Allison just, right, yeah. So we can kind of put Allison aside. Um, and, then, uh, and then it's really trying to figure out Sarah's arc through the, through the season because she's the one that follow, we follow the mystery. And that's the A story of the season. So we have to, have to start with Sarah, and she's always the hardest. And that takes the intricacies of the plot, um, you know, falls on Sarah. And then once we've got a plot down, everybody needs to sort of take a step back and get back to the characters. Now, okay, that's the plot, but what would Sarah actually do? What, what's, you know, that, how, do, how do the characters react in action rather than just service this plot that we've got going? Um, and then, you know, we, so we try and look at those three sisters and what's their relationship for the season? What's their, you know, or, or the, yeah. Um, and then we balance, we'll balance Allison and Kasima around Sarah. Um, I guess that's and, and, and try and figure out how, say, Allison's story intersects with Sarah's story, you know, because it's always good when the stories are kind of coming together and, and then they go off, they diverge for a little while and kind of connect again. And it's nice to see, you know, everyone kind of working, coming together through, even though the storylines may feel sort of individual, it's nice to see them kind of converge. You know, it's always, that's a sort of a feeling of, you go, yeah, yeah and that, everyone gets excited. And that, that happens throughout. That happens in the very last stages of, of script when you're figuring out, okay, well, these storylines may not be, you know, thematically connected or whatever, but if one scene can throw to another visually, we'll find that in editing, we'll find it uh, in the late stages of writing, we'll find it in, in the shooting, and that's, that's the, the process of actually making those story cohesive is very detail-oriented at the end. How much time has passed? Three seasons? <laughs> no. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's TV time, and we're, the f we're really fast-paced. Um, we find it hard to take breaks of time. It's not like, it doesn't feel like a show that you can start one episode and it's two months later and Sarah's sitting on a beach. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is it a month or two? <laughs> uh, we, we do know, we've got it, you know, we do have it mapped down somewhere. Um, and of course, as we're doing it, we break down everything day by day. So each season, we know how much actual time is passing. Um, I don't know offhand but, exactly, but you know, it's not a lot of time. It's, it's one of those things, too, where, you know, like we're hoping, like, people forgive us for Kira growing. We're hoping you'll forgive us for our Toronto seasons as well. <laughs> as we, like, want, end one episode in the dead of winter and start the next one and there's leaves on the trees, you know? <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's... Uh, anyway. Uh, my personal favorite is Allison. Kinda, I, I think that's kind of, uh, you know, she kind of is... Uh, sort of, for me anyway, is sort of based on my sister. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I kind of, I'm the one who grew up in the suburbs and, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of, uh, I identify a lot with that situation, I guess. Um, and, I mean, my favorite clone is Cosima. And I, that's because she's kind of, I'm, I'm from Vancouver and she's kind of West Coast and I like her vibe and her her mind, and she's kind of a stoner. <laughs> um, I, and I just, 
I really enjoy writing her. Uh, she's challenging to write, but I don't. She's not a character you see very often on TV. You don't see. Um, and I'm not talking about um, her sexuality at, at all. I'm talking about just a hippie. It's like hippies. People make fun of hippies. Hippies are smart, and they're gut, and they're the people with the, their hearts right. And and I don't know why they get such a bad rap on TV. You know. And and they're not. They're they're multifaceted too. Like she's a hippie geek, and it makes sense, right? Yeah, she's definitely a geek hey, in this episode. <laughs> but I also like Sarah. Like I have to get get behind Sarah. I love her attitude, and I like that she just punches people when she gets in the corner. <laughs> we're uh, we're pretty clear. We're pretty clear. I mean, you know, listen. We we uh, I I you know I'm not. Sh I don't know that I want to say exactly how many seasons we're working towards, but we are working towards a kind of an end destination. And and have had many, many discussions about not just season three, but beyond, and how, the, how because you have to. You kind of have to know where it's all going. Other, you know, uh, we're not just sort of randomly figuring it out as we go. There is a kind of there is a uh, there is a kind of an organic process though to it. Like even in knowing where you're going, it's it's interesting, uh, certainly from a writing point of view, um, that we can kind of uh, we can kind of you know do this a little bit. You know, like there's uh, um, you know for example there's a, a, a character uh, that we a new character of Mark that we introduced this season who is part of the Prolethians, and uh, you know he should the, the plan was that he was going to die in episode six. And um, and he showed up, and Ari is just such a cool, interesting, weird actor that uh, we were like, we can't kill him. We got to keep him, right? And so there's things like that that you find along the way. But ultimately, we uh, ultimately we know where we're going, and we have confidence uh, in that. It's a complicated process getting there, but but we we definitely are are driving towards uh, the end. Yeah. 324B21. 324B21. Um, there. Uh, I don't, you know, I guess they could. Um, I, it, we've had some talk about, about getting into discovering the other clones' tag numbers and whether they would all mean something together. Uh, but individually, um, maybe it's, uh, uh, it's a puzzle it and see what, see what you come up with. And, <laughs> And that can become canon. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. Uh, it was pretty unbelievable. Uh, I, I, you know, we were just kind of honestly at the beginning. We were just wanted to make a really cool show that we thought was, uh, you know, we had hoped what people were going to think was cool. Also, really, that's all it was. We wanted to make something that was really exciting that we hadn't seen before. That we. Were, um, and we were terrified and, and uh, excited at the same time. And the, 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 the critical response and the fan response was overwhelming, really. It was, uh, and it kind of caught us off guard. It really did. Uh, I don't, I, you know, we kind of, you hope for good reviews and you hope that people will enjoy it, but it just kind of took on this life of its own, you know. And we really sort of saw that last year at Comic Con. Like, even after uh, just only airing one season, you know, and just, you know, people that got so excited about it and, and were so into the pre the whole crazy premise of it. And, and, and uh, you know, we're lucky that, honestly, that we, that we have Tat as well. You know, it's, it's kind of, um, we just kind of, I mean, we're just, we feel very grateful and very, very, very uh, fortunate to be on this journey with all you guys and, and, uh, and be having a, a, a show that, that has been embraced uh, been so embraced by critics and fans it's it's amazing it's been a it's been a a, a, a a truly amazing experience I have to say yeah it's um especially the fan engagement um, uh, is is really rewarding and it's it's not in our TV careers it's nothing that we've uh, been able to experience before it's a real that's a real that's a real gift um, and so much of the fans and the critics and the early going were responsible for the for the buzz around the show building even more um, and now I was just uh, uh, our science consultant is the real Kasima Kasima Herter and she's up right now uh, was working with uh, the writers this week 
And she told us that uh, she was at a conference and there were two academic papers on Orphan Black. <laughs> Which is just, that is like, th that's a whole other weird thing. That's, um, but the fact that it, uh, um, that it's uh, s uh, stimulated discussion around uh, ethics and medical ethics and science, that's, you know, that's, um, it's pretty, uh, pretty rewarding and cool to have, to have spawned a conversation. And that's, um, you know, just wanting to have a conversation is something that the real Kasima says a lot. And I think uh, that the fact that the show does have this, uh, a conversation around it is, is a really rewarding thing. So what we call the, uh, when we were in film school, we called it the coffee question, which is we loved, we loved watching movies and TV where you get out of it and you, you gotta go and have a coffee and talk about it. So uh, we, we try, we, you know, that's part of the, part of what we try and, try and do. And caffeine is very addictive, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, well, that's, it was, it all started with the opening scene uh, on the train platform with Sarah and Beth. John pitched me that idea in 2001. Here's, here's an opening scene, uh, and we had nothing else. Yeah, we didn't know it was clones. We, we, had no, we didn't know it was clones. We just were like, who was that other person on the platform? Was that a twin sister? Was that, that's just... That's, that's a, parallel, a great opening. A parallel universe. John, you bastard! Now I can't. Now we can't let go of it. Um, and so we pursued that from a story point of view, and then, then we are, you know, we wanted to do something exciting and something genre. So it it became clones, and as we researched the clones, uh, or cloning, all of the ethics around it, and we engaged with um, Kasima Herter, um, we realized that clones had got a short shift. And then, and then again, I think sort of, like I said, it becomes about mining theme. It becomes about constantly turning the premise over, turning the characters over, and, and seeing what it's really about. That's when we, dis you know, we realize, you know, and, and the female writers in the room especially are like, do you dudes even know what you're doing here? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, but it's true. Like, in the beginning, it was really, we just wanted to make a really exciting, fast, mystery thriller that was kind of a uh, sort of uh, sci-fi was a kind of a genre sort of thing and we got really excited about the idea of one actor playing a whole bunch of different characters um, and that was kind of that was just sort of how it began and then you know it, as Graham says you, you know the more you go the deeper you go into it the more these themes sort of start to emerge and the more you embrace them and the more they kind of become the fabric of the show and, and now, I mean, we feel a, a responsibility to it um, and a responsibility to uh, keep pushing it with, with characters like Tony, pushing it with all due respect um, and, uh, and with, you know, keeping it, keeping it on our themes and keeping it in the premise of our show. But at the same time, trying to kind of you know, when people are expecting something from us, uh, we like to go the other way. You know, we constantly like to pull the rug out, and this is a big rabbit hole mystery. And we don't like to do, we like to constantly kind of raise the bar on ourselves and just kind of go, okay, yeah, that's too obvious. This has been done. Let's do something that people haven't seen before. And that is constantly the fuel in the, in the writer's room and between us. And that's, so that's kind of, that's just, we, we're just constantly trying to kind of, I guess, come up with things that we haven't seen before and that we want to see. We want to challenge ourselves. Did that answer the question? Yeah, sort of. Okay, cool. good. Uh, I think that's a great note to end on. Okay. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for coming out. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much.